Hi everyone, uh, well, welcome to my session. Delighted to, to be here. Um, thanks for joining and uh, sharing in this experience with me. Uh, this is my first talk um, at Lean Agile Global. I've, I've attended many times, um, but it's the first time I've, I've been invited to speak. So thank you to Jose and the team for giving me the opportunity. My talk is about um, how social is your leadership. And I'm going to take you through uh, a whistle stop tour of leadership, social leadership, and, and my journey into this space, which has really been quite, 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 quite interesting and fascinating. Um, just very quickly, um, let me just see, I can't seem to get my slide moving. One sec. Right. So, just very quick introduction, really. So, as you can see, it's a visual. I, I do a bit of visual visualization stuff, and this is a kind of summary of my my career, really, uh, in the form of a visual using a sort of journey metaphor. Uh, and really, yes, well, you can tell by my Scottish accent, I'm, I'm, I'm based at Scotland, out of Edinburgh. Uh, I'm really in the technology space, so I, I started as a software engineer a um, long, long time ago now, and uh, basically I moved into sort of management leadership type roles, and I've been in the industry for over 20 years. Um, I've kind of been involved with some of the industry bodies as well. See there, the, the, the British Computer Society, they have the industry body for IT, and also the Child Management Institute. Um, and also um, on the on the on the left there, um, you can see Future Work Scotland. So I'm the organised that meetup group. And right in the top corner there, you'll probably recognise. I just want to reflect. I was one of the trustees and part of the advisory team for for that festival I with the share. And we also hosted a, a little after party thing with in collaboration with the, the Lean Agile Global team last night. Um, just before I move on, what's interesting, I guess, about this particular slide is I've split it into formal versus social. This was something I did as part of a a storytelling certification I did sort of during the summer last year. And that theme is going to come up again during the course of this talk. So, so hold that thought. Just moving on. So I want to start with some level setting stuff very, very quickly. So leadership versus management, right? Because there is, there's an obvious distinction, and I'm sure most of you are, are familiar with it. Um, so what is the difference? So before I kind of unveil my, my view of it, I thought it might be nice to very quickly hear from yourself. So if you're happy to, and uh, the next maybe 20, 30 seconds, you drop something into the chat just briefly of what you think the difference is in your view, and then I'll unveil my, my own sort of definitions here, and then we'll move on. So if you're happy to share, feel free to do so. So what do you think management is? What do you think leadership is? Or just something which to you is perhaps a, it signifies the difference? If you if you if you're happy to do so, just just drop it in the chat. I'll give it maybe another 10, 15 seconds. If somebody wants to share anything, you're welcome to do so. Oh nice, Mark. Love that. Preparing others. Thanks, Hazel. That's good. These are all very relevant to what I'm going to be talking about. Excellent. Right. Thanks for that. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna just move on. So What's the difference? So, so I actually came by these definitions when I was um, working through my chart manager program back in 2015 through the, the, the CMI. Uh, and for some reason, my, um, oh, there we go. Right. So management, doing things right. So I think Mark touched on it there nicely. So very much focused on the processes, the operation, probably got a bunch of measures there, KPIs, and did I say OKRs? Uh, and that's really kind of more the typically what the focus on management tends to look like. Whereas leadership tends to be much more like doing the right things um, and much more around sort of that, that vision piece, mission. And I think I think that's probably two definitions I like. They're quite succinct. I, I like to come back to them. I've used them a few times with coaches and mentees. Um, so it's really the difference between the, the how versus the what and the why. So I think you know, they were captured quite nicely in the chat there. It's just a bit of a level set of there. We're going to be talking much more about leadership, not management. So doing a little bit more of a deep dive on this. Uh, so what is leadership? So this is a definition I quite like. Uh, to influence, inspire, and help others become their best selves, building their skills and achieving their goals along the way. So as you can see there on the slide, I've, I've kind of deliberately highlighted a few keywords in red there because they really speak to me. So if I'm thinking about influencing, that ability to, to have that kind of um, capability almost to have a compel to be a compelling force uh, on how you kind of encourage someone else to perhaps you know take a certain view or have a certain opinion or 
if you're inspiring someone, you, you're, you're, you're very much encouraging them to, to do something or, or make them feel like they can, which is very, very important in leadership. And I really like building because that whole act of construction it is really about you know that creation piece, and we are going to come back to that. And of course, achieving, helping people achieve—that's very much about you know the, the, the getting things done, and perhaps against adversity, etc. So a lot of nice stuff in there that will we will be coming back to. So that's a quite nice nice definition there. I've always liked. And obviously, there's been lots of different types of leadership styles and behaviours that we've seen over the years. Uh, just in the top the top right there, much more sort of traditional situational leadership type stuff. Um, created by Hersey and, and Blanchard, I think that would have been back in the late 60s, so early to mid 70s, and that was much more around, there's no one size fits all, right? There's no kind of best fit for leadership. It's really about um, doing the right thing based on the situation. I think they use the term sort of task relevant. So a lot of that was about being task relevant. In the bottom left corner there, you, you know, you, you, you'll certainly be familiar with the um, the work of Robert Greenleaf and in this, this servant leadership space. I'm sure if you're, you know, if you're, if you're a practicing agilist, um, a scrum master, agile coach, etc. And I always loved this particular quote: "Good leaders must first become good servants." Wow. And in the top left there, we've got quiet leadership. So this is much newer forms of leadership, and, and they're much more recent. And I'm going to be talking a lot more about this type of thing. So thinking about, you know, humility, you know. Leaders being humble, kindness, like you know, caring for caring for others, fairness, looking at you know equality, etc., and grace. So really, quite deep, big subjects there, but much more relevant now in terms of leadership than they have perhaps been in the past. And in the bottom right there, um, this is the social leadership net model, and this is what I'm going to be talking about later. So we will be coming back to this. I just wanted to kind of do a quick broad brush intro to. Some of these types of leadership styles you've probably encountered yourself, and we are going to be talking about behaviour shortly. So with that, before I move on to part two, which is going to be much more deeper dive on social leadership, the social age, and talking more about the net model, I wanted to introduce this whole notion of formal versus social leadership. So what do I mean by that? So formal, right? I'm a big film fan. I love my films. I watch a lot of films. So if I get an opportunity to weave in a film quote or introduce a, a, a favourite character that I'm, I'm always kind of keen and happy to do that before I kind of move on with this. But does anybody recognise the film or can, bonus point, if you could tell me the, the name of this character, feel free to, to unmute or drop it in the chat. Did we recognise that? We unmute. Know who that is? Know the film? A few Good Men. Fantastic. Thank you, Hazel. It is indeed A Few Good Men. Anybody know the, the character? Do you have the character? No. Nope. It's Colonel Nathan Jessup. So, so really the reason I, I, I touch on this is because this character is a very good example of what we've traditionally seen, not, not his behaviours per se, hopefully we don't see too much of that, but those sort of formal uh, organisations, formal management leadership structures, very hierarchical in nature, Kind of like what we would class here as perhaps, well, my slide's not working there, positional authority, right? So authority that's granted through position, it, 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 it's very a very formal thing done in very informal environments. Now, contrast that to this whole idea much more of social versus formal. So this is, of course, Martin Luther King, um, civil rights activist, and he was very much the... The, the sort of leading voice and spokesperson for the, the civil rights movement back in the, the 50s and 60s but before um, he was sadly assassinated. Uh, and really, he was a great example of a leader and he had some amazing leadership behaviours, but he didn't have any formal authority, right? He didn't have any authority. So where did, where, did, where, where did his power, so to speak, come from? And that's one of the things we're going to be exploring. And were his behaviours good examples of social leadership? So right, it's time to move on. Part two, social leadership and social age. So before I could talk about social leadership, we really need to talk about the social age because the social leadership is in the context of the social age. So what do I mean by the social age? So the social age is really kind of the environment we're in now. That's kind of where we are right now. Uh, and it, we've, we've kind of transitioned to this, this, this point, having been in the, you know, the manufacturing age and then moved into more like the knowledge age. 
And then from there, uh, the digital age, which most of you will certainly recognize that phrase. Uh, and now we've moved into the, the social age. So it's safe to say that life and work have changed, right? I know I'm stating the obvious there, uh, but really what I mean by that is we're now in a world where change is constant, right? We, we, we basically work from anywhere and everywhere. That, that's kind of how we operate now. That's what we're capable of doing. Communication has changed, right? We've gone from this sort of way that we communicate, the way that we broadcast, the way that conversations and communication canon is moderated has changed, it's much more democratized. And I'll draw your attention to phrases like fact checking, right? <laughs> so you know exactly what I mean. Uh, and with that, we've also got this idea of, of, of social trust and capital. So trust has changed. I talked earlier about behaviors and characteristics of quiet leadership, humility, um, fairness, um, grace, those types of things. Trust is really important. And the relationship between employer and employee has also changed. We now have more of this idea of the social contract. Uh, and that social capital piece is very important because that's really how trust is built. Uh, and it's the social age that's actually given rise to a social leader. And we're going to talk shortly about social leadership behaviours. That's very important because it's through this change in lifestyle and change of environment and the age that we're in now that social leaders have really emerged because they've kind of had to. And it's social leadership who are less focused on that formal type of leadership we touched on there and much more interested in facilitation. So really creating and supporting social learning. So that's back to not really being so much more about knowledge and actually not just the knowledge per se. So that's what the knowledge age was about, but also that sense making. And that sense making comes through actually being able to operate and facilitate through community spaces. And really all of this is ultimately about meaning. That's what the social age is about. And actually organizations who, who don't embrace the social age or aren't able to adapt to change are effectively, sadly, going to ever increasingly over time become less relevant. Just want to talk a little about like, seed setting on the social age there. So moving on, the social leader themselves. So the social leader are the effective leaders who can play and operate effectively in the social age and social spaces. So there's some key characteristics that define these types of, of leaders. So I talked a moment ago about high social capital. So they're able to kind of build trust through some of those behaviors we talked about there, the kindness, the fairness, humility, grace. Those are the foundations of these types of, of, of leaders and their behaviors. As I mentioned, there's no real formal authority. I talked earlier about Martin Luther King. And, and social leaders don't really strive for authority. Authority doesn't really interest them per se. They're not interested in the traditional forms of power. What they're interested in is building that through their reputation. And even then, that's not their goal. They will likely have some sort of aim, but their reputation builds and their authority builds through storytelling and those behaviors there that we see on the right. So actually, they're interested in creating fairness and equality, perhaps in spaces where they don't see it, helping to nurture and develop communities. Again, informal spaces that tend to be fairly flat in structure, and, and they're keen to create learning and sense-making spaces so that people can co-create. And the social leader is much more about storytelling and sharing. They're keen to share, they're keen to get the voices out, and that's why I talked earlier about the democratization of communication. And one of the most fundamental and important things is social leaders are very interested in helping to create and develop other leaders. So social leaders also help make an organization more agile. How do they do this? They do this by actually questioning everything. They don't just accept the state's quo. They're very interested in actually looking at what's happening. They're very adept at responding well to change, and, and they will respectfully challenge try to make things better because they understand that things are going to continue to evolve and they themselves don't want to see their environment stagnate. So the behaviors I talked about earlier, I was talking about humility, grace, fairness. Um, those are those foundations that I was talking about that are key behaviors that allow social leaders to question because they want to do these things respectfully. And actually it's the organizations who haven't or don't adapt and embrace the social change that I mentioned earlier that are going to become less relevant or perhaps cease to exist. And we've seen many, many examples of that over the, over the last five, 10, 15, even years, perhaps. 
So just closing out this particular part, thinking about what I've just discussed there with the social age and the behaviours and characteristics of social leaders, we have this wonderful net model. Now, this is wonderful. I, I, I was really delighted when I first came by this. I absolutely love this. This is created by a wonderful gentleman called Julian Stodd. Julian Stodd is a, a thought leader in community building, storytelling, and, and social leadership. And a lot of what I'm talking about here is based on his work, his blogs, and his books. Um, and really, this model is a, is, is, is a beautiful way to actually think about the journey of social leadership. Um, so the name of it comes from the three dimensions of narrative engagement and technology that you can see there in the middle. Um, and for each dimension, there are three associated components here. Um, and there's also other kind of skills, that unfortunately, I can't aren't on this particular visual, but I'll give you some references at the end so you can do more of a deep dive into that if, if you're interested to do so. Um, so everything starts with narrative, right? So it's that whole idea of curation and creating a story, creating a narrative, and then sharing that. So it's quite nice the way that the way the model actually flows cyclically. And then what you want to do is you want to share these ideas in community spaces or by sharing, actually help nurture and build the community. I talked earlier about reputation and authority, and what I like about this is actually it's the reputation that builds, and through that sharing, the reputation builds, that trust builds. I talked about high social capital, and from there, that's how the social leaders' authority builds. They're not, they're not striving for that authority. It's a means to an end. And then ultimately, all of this is underpinned and facilitated through technology. Uh, and that's really about collaboration co-creation, which you can do in sense-making spaces like communities, and also looking and focusing on building that social capital. So all three of these come together to really help social leaders develop. Uh, and it's a brilliant model. And in the next section, I'm going to kind of give you a bit of an overview of how these ideas can be applied in practice. So I've actually been trying to do some of this stuff, and I hadn't even realized that I was actually doing it to begin with. So in the day job, I, I talked about some of my, my background there. So, so I'm in engineering, I'm a principal um, within, within, within financial services, uh, within that West Group, uh, the bank, and I work across large um, communities of engineers across a, a large enterprise of thousands and thousands of, of engineers. And part of my role is, we, so I'm working on sort of helping build capability and enhancing culture, communication, and helping these communities thrive. That's really what I'm doing. A lot of my role is not about the kind of traditional sort of technical development. I don't cut code, that type of stuff. I'm interested in the people side of things uh, and culture. And really that's kind of where I come into this. And I became the community lead for an initiative to mobilize, socialize, and embed uh, a Q&A &A platform, a community platform called Stack Overflow, which you might have heard of if you're in the dev space or if you work with lots of developers. And it is a, a world leading uh, quality and answer platform. And that's one of, one of the things I was tasked to do. And really, while I was working through this initiative and really trying to get leaders or uh, engineers on boarded, I was thinking a lot about the narrative. I was thinking about the storytelling. And really, at the heart of all of this was this idea of community uh, and questions. So the questions at the very heart of what I was trying to do. So as engineers and knowledge workers, uh, problem solvers, and they have countless questions every day. An engineer sitting there, he's working on something, he's maybe trying to compile code or whatever, and he gets stuck, he gets blocked. And what the engineer then has to do is they have to try to go and figure out how they're going to solve those problems and where they're going to seek inspiration and support and get help to answer that question. So I've seen a bit of a shift in that. So what we've tried to do as part of this, this, this storytelling, this narrative that I've created is make that shift from this traditional type of model where an engineer might reach out to multiple sources. It's quite a decentralized model. You know, they might go and look at documentation, go on the cloud or on you know cloud storage space. They might dig through, sift through all emails because they're trying to, you know, they've got this in their inbox somewhere or filed away and they can't find it. And 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 then they might reach out to people who they think can help them through the through the chat facilities that exist within their organization. But this is, as I say, very decentralized. And, and typically quite labor intensive, and they might not get a successful outcome. So what we're trying to do is make that shift to more of this kind of model, which is where engineers can go through one centralized kind of platform and crowdsource an answer and get support from countless other subject matter experts who are also on the platform. 
and are engaging with one another and collaborating, and co-creating and making sense of things. So that's really what we've tried to do, we've created a, a narrative around this. And what I've also been doing, so this was, this was quite a nice exercise to go through. So as part of the social leadership model, uh, Julian also talks about six tenets here. They're, they're principles. So I see them as principles. Julian uses the term tenets. Uh, and really, this, the, the, the six of them here. So being curious, try, learn, and try, sharing, being humble, telling stories, being fair and protected. So what you'll probably recognize is I've already touched on and talked about a lot of these themes as I've built up to this point in the story that we've shared together. And what I've done is I've looked at some of the things we did on this particular initiative, trying to get this socialized across thousands and thousands of communities of engineers, but in different domains and different franchises. And they all have slightly different cultures and ways of working in these spaces within this huge global enterprise. And, and, and trying to create that kind of narrative around exploration. It's a journey. And trying to be brave and courageous around trying to be willing to answer those questions. I talked earlier about, you know, trying to question everything, looking at the status quo, trying to get permission to challenge things. And then we've also looked at, as well as the technical platform coming in, looking at ways that people can collaborate, the engineers can come together on this platform. How do they support each other? We've been very open with the communications. So I've doing weekly communications to all of the hundreds and thousands of engineers who are on this platform, sharing stories, celebrating successes, sharing best practice, but doing it in a very, in a very open and transparent fashion. But also being very clear that actually um, we don't have all the answers. We don't know everything. This is a journey that we're on. And really encouraging people to come in. We haven't forced this upon people. We're not mandating that people come into these spaces. Are simply trying to create the story and narrative to encourage them to do so because we see some benefit in doing so. And as I say, they are telling stories around the opportunities and the benefits and successes to give them value and reason to actually get involved and get engaged. And we talked earlier about humility and fairness and these sorts of behaviours. And in this, we're also trying to do this right way. As I mentioned, we don't want to force people. I didn't want to see my leaders you know, forced me to kind of mandate that people be sort of brought onto this platform, wanted it to be their choice. This is a contributive platform, you know, giving them a model to contribute because they see value in doing so, and they gain something from doing so. And creating other spaces, so alongside having the platform, creating drop-in sessions. I run drop-in sessions weekly, which are very informal spaces to give members of the community opportunity to join these calls, meet other members of the community, share ideas, and basically co-create solutions and also support one another. So these are really key themes. And right at the end there, we're talking about, it's all about the individual. If they want to be involved, they can be, and we're providing the social technology and tools to encourage them and getting them to help champion what we're doing. So helping take those stories and narratives back into their own communities. And that's how this network has grown across this large enterprise. That's really what we're trying to do there. So just some kind of ideas there around the six tenants and examples of how those have applied to this particular initiative. And just some closing final thoughts. Um, so this is a kind of summary. So what, what, what have we covered here? So I think it's fair to say we're in the social age now and really it benefits us to embrace that. There's different ways that we can do that. Um, effective forms of leadership are going to continue to evolve. I uh, gave some examples at the outset about some of the leadership behaviours and styles that we've all seen over the years. Um, so that's very, very important. It's very important to stress that the social leadership is complementary to formal. It doesn't replace it, it sits alongside it. There'll be cases and scenarios where formal leadership perhaps needs to be subverted by social forms of leadership because they will bring the greater benefits. And that certainly applies when I was talking earlier about trust, social capital, and some of these ideas. Creating those social spaces, and we talked earlier just now about real world examples of running drop in sessions and having sort of online communities and spaces for people to communicate, converse, collaborate, create meaning out of things. That, that's really where the magic happens. And it's in those types of communities. So, in my organization, we have lots of communities of practice. So, as part of this, I've been socializing these ideas within those spaces. Um, and really, that's where the, the unheard voices surface. They don't surface in the formal spaces surface in these types of spaces, those safe spaces as we, as we typically talk about, you know, um, psychological safety, et cetera. Uh, and I've talked a lot about, you know, doing everything through creating that narrative, that storytelling. That's what I've been doing here. That's what we have been doing in this initiative. 
but it's taking a very human-centered approach to engagement. And that's critical to success in adopting these types of behaviors. It's a very quick summary of some of the core ideas I've touched on there. And really the stage is set, the stage is yours. So I would kind of ask and ask you to take away, think about what does the social age mean to you? Which aspects of what I've talked about resonate with you, which perhaps don't, which have you seen, which have you not seen? Um, what about your own social behaviors, your social leaders' behaviors? Do you believe that you exhibit some of the things that I've talked about during the course of this session? Uh, perhaps you can think of good examples of social leaders in your own orgs. I'm sure you can. Uh, and there are many of them out there. Um, I encourage you to have a think about some of those things. Just to close out, um, remaining couple of minutes, um, another good example here, Gandhi. Um, and this is, a, this, is a, this is a quote I love. A sign of a good leader is not how many followers you have, but how many leaders you can create. I think ultimately that's what great social leadership looks like. Uh, I've covered a lot of stuff here. I, I, I grant you that. It's quite a lot to squeeze into 30, 30 minutes. Um, these are the um, references and books I would recommend. Social Leaders at Handbook uh, is Julian's book based on all of the stuff that I've covered here. My talk and my work in this space is all inspired by and, 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 and developed from Julian's amazing work. So I would really encourage you to get yourself a copy of that book if you're interested to learn more. He talks about a lot more detail about the net model and all the stuff that I've really scratched the surface of, frankly. Uh, also, I'm a big fan of Brenny Brown's work, so I would definitely encourage you to read Dear to Lead if that's of interest, and certainly the aspects around wholehearted leadership. And of course, the seminal text that is Southern Leadership by Robert Greenleaf, and you'll recall earlier on, I, I, I quoted uh, Robert um, when I was talking about Southern Leadership. So key texts I would definitely recommend that are very relevant and applicable to, to what I'm covering here in this talk. And if you would like to, to keep in touch uh, and talk some more about this stuff, I will be around all day. I will be in the well spaces. I'll be in other sessions. You can, you're welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you want to see more of my visual work, you can see that on my um, Instagram feed on, on, on Visual South. Um, on Instagram, I'm active on Twitter. You can reach me on my handle at Southpal. And, if you want to you join me on some future sessions of my meetup, you're welcome to do so. Uh, future Work Scotland, you'll find it meetup. We run fortnightly sessions with speakers from all over the globe. And that's me, really. I have a lot to cover, and I'm going to talk and just catch my breath. Uh, thanks for listening. Um, really enjoyed this experience. Thank you for sharing it with me. Thank you for listening. Hope that was useful to you and gave you some, something to think about and perhaps take away into your own work. Uh, and, yeah. I don't really think we've got time for questions, sadly, but um, yeah, I'm happy to, to take questions off. Like just, just, just reach me directly. And um, yeah, that, that, that's my session. So really appreciate you taking the time and hope you enjoyed it. And, and thanks again and enjoy the, the, the rest of the conference.